Good evening. Yeah. Welcome from the Manhattan Institute. I'm Michael Hendricks. I'm the director of state and local policy here at the Manhattan Institute. It's an honor to be with you here tonight. Our topic tonight could not be more important or vital for what we do and for our city. As one of our speakers tonight recently wrote, raising a family in the city is just too hard. And as I'm sure for some of you in the audience know, that's true even in the best of circumstances. And for our biggest cities, these really have been the best of times. Places like New York have come back in a big way. Uh, young, educated people have flocked back to the city. Uh, jobs are good, the money's there, crime is down. Uh, on the way over here, I was doing a little bit of uh, back of the envelope math in my head. As a New Yorker, you can eat in a different restaurant every hour of every day, all year long, and still have nearly 2,000 restaurants left to try out in Manhattan alone. So we've got so much to do, it's so fun here. But what's also looked like the best of times for cities also seems like among the worst of times for families. You see this in the stats, you see it on our streets. In New York City, as in many great American cities, households and birth rates are getting smaller and smaller. And even as they grow their ranks of children, rich, or even as they grow the ranks of childless, I should say, childless, rich, college-educated young whites, America's densest cities are losing families with children. So to talk about the future of families in childless cities is also in a way to talk about the future of cities, to talk about the future of us, of all of us in cities. So to help us answer these questions, we've brought together thinkers, writers, and builders. On our panel in just a little bit will be Kay Heimowitz, the William E. Simon Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. We're also joined by Brad Hargraves, the founder and CEO of Common, a co-living startup. Raihan Salam, the president of the Manhattan Institute, will be our moderator this evening. And we're also joined by Derek Thompson, a staff writer at The Atlantic, who recently wrote a hotly debated piece on just this topic. Derek will come up for just a bit to kick us off with a few thoughts, and then we'll dive into our panel discussion. Derek? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I, I really do want to sincerely apologize to the entire audience and to the Princeton Club for missing the jacket memo. Um, what you are seeing this evening is not some kind of sartorial protest against Princeton Club rules. This is mere forgetfulness, um, and I apologize for that. Um, so several weeks ago, uh, I moved from New York. I was tired of the muggy summers and the oppressive concentration of media people here. So I moved to Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, and before leaving New York, I, as a writer, am contractually obligated to publish my Why I'm Leaving New York essay. I wanted to do a fresh spin, though, on the tired genre, and so I figured one thing that probably no one had done yet was a, a data-driven, census-based piece about why other people are leaving New York, in which in the final paragraph I would reveal that other people in this construction served as a third-person plural sort of uh, reference to myself. That article was about an emerging phenomenon that I called the childless city. So what do I mean by the childless city? I don't mean that the city has no children. What I mean, and which was beautifully summarized by Michael, is that we are living in a, at a time, and specifically in a city, where the share of the population that is parents of school-aged children is declining precipitously. And I think the best way to get at this idea with giving us the proper amount of context is to ground it in three facts. And so with each fact, we're just going to get sort of closer and closer to the meat of the issue here. So um, I'll be sort of parachuting from the exosphere until we land in the most relevant territory. So the first fact is about babies and baby making, and that is that fertility is declining everywhere. It's not just declining in Manhattan. It's not just declining in cities. It's not just declining in the U.S. It's declining in practically every developed and developing country in the world. 
it is really, really difficult to find social trends that are happening simultaneously in the US and Sweden and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Lesotho and Brazil. But this is one of them. Now we can debate the reasons for declining fertility and the implications, but as long as we're discussing any trend that involves children and families and the decisions they make, I think this point has to be made up front and center. The second big fact, the second really important thing to remember is that most big, dense, expensive cities have declining domestic migration. So the census keeps track of two different kinds of migration. International migration, meaning someone moved from not America to an American neighborhood, and then domestic migration, meaning you're moving from one American neighborhood to another. So most in most cities, more Americans, it seems, are moving out than moving in. And this has been true for New York for almost this entire century. It's been true of Chicago and Los Angeles for almost this entire century. Most big, most big metros have essentially been growing because of their immigration populations, not strictly because so many native-born Americans are moving in and staying. And really interestingly, this is true in the northeast quadrant of the US specifically, because most of the migration that you're seeing is Americans moving from large cities, especially in the northeast, to the south and west. So if you look at, say, the northeast quadrant of the US, north of the Mason-Dixon line, and at the Mississippi River, and east, only three cities with a population, only three metros with a population greater than one million, are actually seeing positive domestic migration. They are Indianapolis, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Columbus. That means for all the rest, more people are moving out than moving in if you don't count immigrants. That's New York, that's Chicago, that's Boston, Philadelphia, Detroit, Baltimore, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Bridgeport, New Haven, Pittsburgh, Rochester, Springfield, Buffalo, Providence, Albany, Syracuse, and Scranton. This is not just a New York issue, this is a metro issue, a city issue, and most importantly, a relatively cold metro issue. The third fact, and the one that is most central though to today's conversation, is that a very particular migration pattern is fundamentally changing the demographics of these large, dense, rich cities. And that's young, educated people moving in and most other demographics moving out. Most importantly for our purposes, families that have school-aged children. And this dynamic especially is yielding what I have called the childless city. So how do we know this is happening? As I was writing this piece, I reached out to an economist named Jed Kolko, who's really a master of working IPUM's data and census data to figure out really specific demographic changes city to city. And I asked him to look at this picture uh, from the perspective of looking at the highest density tracks in the US and looking at education, the sort of uh, parenting level, parenting uh, uh, level and, uh, and race. And so Coco looked at these three things and he found one, that the population share of parents of school aged children was declining. Two, that the population of young people without children was growing. And three, that the population of white college graduates with no school-aged children was absolutely soaring, up 20% this century alone. In the article, I wrote that America's urban rebirth was missing a key element, births. Now, on reflection, that was too cute. Um, it was also not entirely correct. Brooklyn does not want for babies. There are a lot of them there. What's happening, it seems, in a lot of American cities isn't that the parents are leaving in order to have that first child, but rather that in places like, say, Park Slope, they're having the first child and moving out of New York before they enter kindergarten. And I think that's a really important point as we're beginning to think about exactly what services we want cities to build if they're going to be attractive to the families of the future. Because if we don't build these services, if these trends continue, I wrote, cities are in danger of becoming theme parks of childless affluence, where the rich can behave like children without having to see any. So, okay, some of you might be thinking, so what? 
Happy singles are not a tragedy. Childlessness is not a sin. There is no ethical duty to marry and procreate until your fertility has exceeded the replacement rate. So what exactly is the matter with the childless city? I think we're gonna talk about that a bit in the panel so I don't want to steal too much thunder. In the piece I wrote about several concerns but I'll just focus on one really briefly here and that is equity. It is incoherent for Americans to talk about equality of opportunity in an economy where high paying work is concentrated in places where families cannot stay. And I want rich people to be able, I want, excuse me, non-rich people to be able to benefit from a phenomenon where American metros participate in a winner-take-all economic system. Just one quick last note before we go to the panel, and that's that I've been writing a lot recently about city trends and demographics. Not all of these pieces have been what you might call optimistic. And some people read these articles about cities and they uh, assume that as a critic, I hate cities. I want to assure you that I come here in an anti-Marcus Aurelius fashion. I, I come to praise cities and not to bury them. I lived in New York for seven years. I live in DC and love it unabashedly. I lived in Chicago and adored it. My sister lives in Los Angeles and I love to visit her there. I want cities to cast off their 21st century reputations as temporary portals for the young and to feel like they're participating in an entertainment machine for the rich. And I want cities to reaffirm their commitment to being a home for the whole person, the whole life, and the whole family. Thank you. Kay, you are our great chronicler of the revival <laughs> of American cities. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about the role that families with children played in the great revival of New York in particular. Yeah, um, <clears throat> some of you may know, in fact, some of you definitely know, that uh, I moved to Brooklyn uh, in 1982 or you know, in the early 80s at a time that nobody was doing that kind of thing, or very few people were doing that kind of thing. So I've watched this incredible transformation of my borough, of particularly of my neighborhood, Park Slope. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, as Derek said, there's still a lot of babies <laughs> around, but people are struggling. And I want to talk to you a little bit about why we, how we got from here, from there to here. So, as, you know, most of you probably know that for much of the 20th century, people, middle class people, wanted to get the hell out of cities with their families. Um, they did not see the city as a place to raise children. Uh, and, you know, we often talk about that in terms of white flight. That, I think that's a little misleading. Uh, you know, it's not to say that racial animus didn't play a role, but what there had always been a tendency for middle class New Yorkers to push out into the boundaries where there was more greenery, more uh, where it was cleaner. Remember, this was an industrial city, Brooklyn in particular, uh, and it wasn't a great place to uh, to be raising children, and people wanted to get out. Uh, there, Park Slope was originally a streetcar suburb. You know, uh, it is no longer seen that way, but that's that's the way it was. Um, now, this preference for the suburbs began to change uh, by 1980 or so. Um, I was part of that first movement out of. In fact, I moved from this from Westchester to to come here to my parents' great distress, um, <laughs> had two young children at the time. It seemed like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? But um, I uh, was not alone. Uh, there was this emerging trend at the time. And I want to pinpoint two reasons that I think this trend developed. That is, of uh, women like myself, middle class women like myself, educated women, 
um, and families moving, moving into the city. Um, and one of, the, one of them is that there was the emergence of the knowledge economy city. I mean, industry was leaving. Uh, the knowledge economy city was cleaner. You know, uh, yes, it was somewhat crime ridden at the time I moved in, and we can talk about that separately. I'm not going to go into that at the moment. Uh, but uh, it was um, not a place that was particularly appealing to people who wanted a little bit of space, cleanliness, um, peace, a little bit of peace. But uh, people did start to move back because of this knowledge economy. That's where the good jobs were. So they wanted to come back for that. And the second major reason is women. Because what happened is that women uh, wanted to work. They were uh, very well suited to this new knowledge economy I just mentioned. So um, they went and got educations. By 1980, uh, women equaled the number of women who were, or percentage of women who were graduating with a BA was, was the same as men. It has since then surpassed them. Uh, they've gone even further when it comes to uh, tertiary education. So they were well suited for this new economy and also because the jobs were less uh, you know, required less brawn and, and strength, and uh, uh, you didn't have to uh, be working around people who were spitting and <laughs> using rough language or whatever it was, <laughs> however you want to stereotype that. Um, but uh, women increased their education, and that led to two consequences. And I'll, I'll uh, mention those quickly, and then we can move on to somebody else. But um, one of them was that women were putting off marriage because they were getting, women and men, were putting off marriage and childbearing as they got more education, more training, uh, started their early years of work, in, and, which they wanted to do in the city. So you suddenly saw, or not so suddenly, but gradually saw uh, after the 1980s, into the 1990s and 2000s, a um, lot of singles, 20, single 20-somethings, childless, moving into the city after college to, uh, spend the, to, to pursue their careers, which were more likely to do, they were more likely to do successfully in the cities where the good jobs were in this new knowledge economy I mentioned before. So they moved to the cities, uh, and um, the city, the marketplace responded, right, with bars and restaurants and all of the uh, kinds of fun things that young people wanted to, to do. And uh, as this went on, um, and I've written, this in, uh, written about this elsewhere, um, you saw marriage, um, marriage uh, age of marriage, going up and up and up as people, they, you know, the 20s were turning into a good time and people wanted to enjoy them in the cities, the people who, who could. Uh, so that was one way that the um, increase in the number of women, uh, educated women, uh, changed cities. But the other way was this. When those women that I'm describing, the, sec the single women that I'm describing, um, did marry and have children, they took one look at the commuting times from <laughs> Scarsdale or Great Neck and got on the phone to call the real estate agents in, uh, in the Upper West Side or Brooklyn. Uh, it simply wasn't feasible or was very difficult to be commuting when you had young children, or even teenagers for that matter, uh, long distances and a 40 to 50 hour job, a week job. Uh, there's a very interesting study that was done for NBER uh, about um, this shift. It's a 2015 paper. And what they found, what the uh, researchers found was that the people who are most likely to move into the cities uh, and to choose to move in the cities were women with higher educations, 
Uh, and uh, they traced also this rise in the uh, prices of housing as this influx of well-educated, highly skilled, and relatively affluent families started to move back. Now, of course, that shifted, and, and that's, I think, what, what will really be our subject today. Well, it hasn't shifted. I think the desire is still there for the same reasons I just enunciated, that, that it's just very difficult to combine work and family if you are commuting uh, into the suburbs. Uh, and the city has so much more to offer, I think, young families than it did um, at least when I first moved here, uh, uh, and, and even, even, um, even 10 years later. Uh, despite the fact that we're becoming more childless, there still are a lot of perks uh, to, being, to being in the city. So that's a little bit of background for you about how we got to the point where there were so many young families living here, uh, and then we can talk about why they are no longer able to afford it. Brad, Derek has offered a pretty bleak portrait of how family formation looks uh, in uh, big US cities. You have built a series of businesses that aim to address uh, some of the affordability challenges. And most recently, uh, you've been involved in a joint venture mm -hmm. that is particularly looking at families. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts on kind of the, the bigger picture that both Derek and Kay have laid out for us, and also how you've tried to tackle it? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting to think about the delta between preference and reality. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we got our start actually building co-living spaces at Common. Is we saw that to you those know, who don't know what a co-living space well, is, yeah, it's 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 effectively roommates done better is the way to think <laughs> about it. Uh, you know, one of my favorite stats that really got us excited back five years ago uh, about this opportunity was you look at household typologies. Just in let's just constrain it to New York, but a lot of other metros look similar. There are more roommate households than there are nuclear families in the five boroughs by actually a pretty wide margin. Five boroughs, eight million people, about you know, three and a half million households. Are you considering people living, so are people living alone excluded from that comparison? That is excluded. Okay. If you add people living alone, it's a majority of all households. So New York City household typologies came from a 2011 study called Making Room by CHPC, Citizens Housing and Planning Committee. Awesome organization. 33% of all households, single person living alone in the five boroughs of New York. Second largest typology, roommates. 23% of all households, unrelated adults sharing a unit. Can I just ask you, um, the single households are not more likely to be in Manhattan? I don't know the breakdown by borough. I'm sure Staten Island is quite different than Manhattan and Brooklyn. That is all boroughs together. Right, I remember years ago reading a statistic that said something like the only place where there are smaller households than Manhattan is some leper colony. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's true. I'm sure Manhattan, I'm sure Manhattan, North Brooklyn and Long Island City probably yeah. skew that yeah. uh, in, in, in a yeah. fair direction. Uh, but I'm just talking about five boroughs lumped in together. 33% are, are single individual living alone. 23% are unrelated adults sharing a unit. Wow. Roommates. No, that's different. That's a separate no. category. <laughs> unrelated adult meaning like not in a romantic relationship. Uh, now that includes two categories. That's both we, what we think about as like, you know, high socioeconomic class, but perhaps low wealth, low income roommates. That also includes immigrant households that are sharing right. units. Now that's a big chunk as well. It's actually right. about half and half, uh, both you know high wealth, high income, or sorry, uh, low income but high socioeconomic class roommates grad that we students, all grad let's students say, right. uh, and first generation immigrant households, you know, packed into a house in Flushing. Mm -hmm. uh, Twenty three percent are uh, the unrelated adult sharing unit. 18% are traditional nuclear families, parents and kids, only 
11% are couples in a romantic relationship without kids. That includes both on the front end and on the back end, both empty nesters and uh, uh, people who have not yet had kids or will not have kids. So we saw that and we're like, clearly there's a disconnect between the type of housing that's being built and the type of housing that is in demand. So we started building housing designed for roommates. Uh, today we have about 1,000 units in operation, about 10,000 currently under development, 120 buildings. Uh, and the most remarkable stat is we get about 15,000 applicants a month. So mm -hmm. the, the demand for this is pretty wild. Uh, we're working on that. Um, so let's shift for a second, because we're here to not talk about roommates, but talk about families. We can talk about roommates all day long. We are an enabler of delayed, uh, of delayed adulthood, uh, no question. <laughs> uh, so the stat I will use to shift this conversation, um, we all talk about people having fewer kids, fewer kids, fewer kids. Derek is 100% right that if you want to find a macro trend that spans socioeconomic groups, geographies, what have you, it is that we are having fewer kids. However, if you ask people how many kids do you want, that has not changed. If anything, it has ticked slightly up in the last decade. About 2.4, 2.5 kids. Mm -hmm. You ask a young man, young woman, how many kids do you want? Pretty much stayed the same. So what you've seen is actually this gap between how many kids are you having and how many kids do you want. And that's really interesting. Because what it tells me is that there's a gap between what people are desiring and what they're able to do through, through whatever combination of things. And you compare that with, you know, I have to talk about my personal experience. I live in Chelsea with my wife. I have two little kids. We have a one-year-old. We have a three-year-old. And wow, it is hard. It is really hard. And I have the benefit of having sold my last company for $400 million. But it's still really hard. So like I, I, I'm you know, privileged in everything, and I will acknowledge that. But it's still really hard. And we were lucky. We had another couple down the street. They had a kid the same age, friends of ours. You know what we did? We hired a nanny together. We did a nanny share. It was the best thing we ever did. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking a lot about the role of, of a residential operator and a residential developer. I live in a big building in Chelsea. And uh, you know, they could be doing a better job. I, I, you know, they, they fix the sink and the toilet, and that's great. But like, they could be doing such a better job to make living and raising a family in the city easier. They're, they're falling down on their responsibility. There's like 30 families in my building, and there's nothing. No shared play spaces. If I want to you know, drop my kid off and go take my wife on a date, there's, a, there's not, nothing. There's aggregation of families, and we're not doing anything with that. So we started another company. Mm -hmm. This time it's a joint, joint venture with Tishman Spire called Kin. And we are building ground up residential buildings for families in urban centers. It's all two and three bedroom apartments that open into shared play spaces with nanny share, date night drop off, babysitter share, shared place just really built for kids, built for families. Uh, we're piloting our first one in Long Island City right now. Uh, and we'll be opening in a handful of cities in the, the next couple of years. So we're excited about that and, uh, and, and where we're going. And hopefully we can uh, you know, start you know, doing something about this delta between what people want and what people have. I think that's fantastic. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Um, you said there's a difference, essentially, between the stated and revealed preference here. And maybe mm -hmm. it's not revealed preference, but between the stated interest in families wanting to have, say, 2.4 kids and the reality that they're having 1.6. Not literally 1.6, but on average. Um, <laughs> so are those polls being conducted before the parents have any child? Yes. Because it is possible that the experience of having a child makes parents dissuades them from having yes. more children. I 100% buy that. They actually that. would prefer yeah. to have the 1.6 and the 2.4. Right. They're like, I, I want exactly 0.8 fewer child right now. 
I, given I, my but experience, I, I, with, with but one I don't point know out. if that is it, it, assuming the poll has been taken at the same time through. You know, and I, I don't know exactly yeah. the, the, the polling methodology. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with with your overall point at all. I, I I think that even if parents didn't necessarily, even if we couldn't prove that parents wanted to have more children, we should still have policies at the federal, state, and local level that make it easier for children to be had. I am one hundred percent with you there. But I right. wonder whether I, I just wonder how significant it is that there's a delta between the stated preference and the reality if the stated preference is essentially made in ignorance of what it means to raise. But wasn't it always <laughs> made in ignorance? Yeah. 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 Like you ask a 22-year-old how many kids more, you want to have. It'd be more it's... meaningful, I think, if, if they had already had one child well, or two. Well, this is something I, I, I'm curious to ask both uh, Derek and Kay to, to build on this a little bit. So Kay was talking about uh, kind of invoking this idea of the entertainment machine, how much more uh, delightful life for a 20-something might have become. And, and part of this per perhaps is a reflection of changing social norms. Uh, when you think about child rearing, it has been difficult since time immemorial. But when you think about life as an unmarried, childless 20-something, in some ways it's become more pleasurable, more stimulating, more interesting, especially if you have the resources to live in one of these entertainment machine cities, et cetera. How much uh, of this do you think is just intrinsic to the fact that uh, basically life without children has become less stigmatized, more interesting, more stimulating than was the case 50 years ago, while the experience of child rearing has just continued to be something that is really demanding and difficult? I would add one other thing to that, and that is that child rearing today is, is more demanding than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't need to describe to most of you what it, what it takes to prepare a child for this knowledge economy that I've been talking about. And most middle class parents are trying to do that. And it starts, I mean, it starts in pregnancy. I'm watching my two daughters go through this myself. Um, and uh, the kind of thinking that is required to, and, and input, I think that's, that's one way of putting it where it, it's, a, it's a daily, hourly you know, thing where you're trying to figure out how are you stimulating the child? How are you making sure that they're being, um, that they're learning their words, their, their spelling, their letters, their, you know, it goes on and on and on and it starts very young. Uh, and at the same time, you've got two working parents in, a lot, in, most, in most of these families actually. So I think there's a lot more that, I think that when children were more in addition to a, a household economy, that's obvious. You wanted more kids. That's no longer the case, of course. But even um, in the dreaded 50s, when I was growing up, um, there was a sense in which there was a child's world that parents, mm. that adults didn't have to be so engaged in mm. all the time. And I, you know, I lived a fairly pro privileged suburban life, but we, my parents weren't worrying about all this stuff. Now they do, and, and um, I suppose they have to. I mean, you, one could argue that they go to, people go too far these days, but I would add that into this. Mm -hmm. Uh, into this uh, uh, mix. I was, um, I'm working on an article right now about, uh, this is being taped, it will yep. be shared, well, okay, well, it, hopefully the article will be published by the time um, <laughs> <laughs> people start watching this. Um, I, uh, I'm working on an article right now about um, the history of atheism in America hmm. and the rise of atheism, which is really interesting because basically what you see with religious non-affiliation um, is for the vast majority of American history, non-affiliation is basically steady at like 7%. It's not changing. And then suddenly in the 1990s, it starts to, it starts to ramp up and just sort of rises and rises to the 1990s, 2000s, and today. And it's a really one of these fascinating hockey stick moments that history doesn't often provide. And so mm -hmm. when it does provide it, you're like, mm -hmm. what's going on? Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a, um, a professor from Notre, from Notre Dame about some of the reasons why uh, religious non-affiliation might be taking off. And we walked through some historical examples, like say the, um, the, the, the disconnection between atheism and communism that sort of was, mm. was broken in 1991. Um, but what he said was he said, delayed adulthood. I said, mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. I said, you, you gotta unpack that one for me a little bit. He said, well, 
a lot of young people are using their 20s to determine who they are. And they're trying on different identities. And they're having a lot of fun. And they're in cities, which have historically been a little bit more secular than the historical countryside, although that's not always the case. Um, and so by the time they get married, and they have a kid, and they become the kind of family unit that would typically belong to a church, they've actually already done all the work of identity construction and realized, I'm not a church kind of person. And so they tend to be either casual sort of church goers, or they don't go at all. And I would add one thing, Please, which yeah. is the growth of interfaith marriage. Uh, yeah, and, and intra non-faith marriage, right. the atheists marrying each other. Right. Um, and so what that makes me think that like preferences are not stable in one's 20s. People, like the, the rule of your 20s is that you're changing your mind constantly about what you want. And you can do this in a way that's really historically unprecedented. Hmm. You can do it with romantic partners. It is utterly acceptable in ways that it did not necessarily used to be, certainly before the 1960s, to date many, many people, sometimes at the same time, break off relationships, go back to relationships, take your entire 20s to get married, get married by your early 30s. That's not a particularly, that's, that's a very common thing now. Mm -hmm. And, but I also think that people might realize in their early 30s that their preferences have changed and that the fun has been had and it's now time to make a new decision. And I see this, and this is anecdotal, so I apologize, I don't really have um, data for this, but I definitely noticed it in my life, in my friend's life. I have a lot of friends who were single through their 20s, got married in their 30s, and all of a sudden their preferences in city and entertainment and life have just utterly changed. They're thinking, now I I'm utterly ready to have a family now. And now I'm thinking about, you know, do I move to the suburbs? Do I want a lawn? What, where exactly do I see myself? It's not necessarily the East Village. The East Village was me in my 20s. I've changed. And I've noticed this in myself. I, I lived in New York for seven years between 2012 and 2019, between the age of basically 26 and 33. And the, what I've been telling people, they're like, why did you leave New York? I mean, this, I get this from New York a lot. Um, actually, in D.C. too, though. Why leave New York for D.C.? <laughs> and why are you here? <laughs> um, you made it. Um, and the answer that I give is that I left D.C. to go to New York because New York promised inexhaustibility of options. Mm. That I'd finished D.C. and I was ready to live in a city that was exactly, as Michael explained, inexhaustible mm -hmm. in its opportunities. And by the time I turned 32, Somewhere. inexhaustibility became exhaustion. The idea that there were new places opening up every single day became an existential culinary crisis. And I was like, <laughs> I want to live in a place where there's like a sweet green, a great Indian restaurant, a great Mexican restaurant, a cocktail bar, and that's it. <laughs> and so I, I actually want us to, I know Brad, you've done some thinking about this, about revealed preferences and where people live. I also want us to consider the possibility that as wonderful as cities are for a lot of parents to raise their kids, there might also be this group of people who have a preference that is set in by their late 20s, early 30s, that is very different from the kind of city that was their home in their 20s mm -hmm. when they were a different person, that they've changed. And in order to honor what is essentially an identity mm -hmm. shift, they feel like they have to do the work of changing their geography. I think the interesting split here is in the past, and still in a lot of people's heads, aging out of living in Manhattan meant that you moved to Scarsdale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today it means you moved to Nashville. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really worth digging in to why that is. I think, Kay, you're spot on that commuting times play a huge role in that. There's been a lot of, lot of studies around happiness and what leads to happiness and what leads to unhappiness. And the one thing that has been universal, the biggest correlate to unhappiness is long commute time. Of course, that was before podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be before autonomous vehicles. Right. And like, uh, yeah, well, who knows? It could always turn. But yeah, you're right. You're seeing not, <laughs> yeah, and now no, you can debate is that because people would rather be in Nashville than Scarsdale? Or is that because Scarsdale has not permitted any new housing, mm 
in 40 years. Well, Brad, here you are now touching on where the rubber meets the road, all of the different policy questions that arise. So, uh, you know, you raise one, congestion, and the fact that you have many cities that are along many different dimensions incredibly desirable, however, have done such a terrible job of dealing with the congestion problem that they become kind of cripplingly painful for people uh, to live in them. There's another issue that you've tackled directly. When you're looking at many cities where it's incredibly difficult and expensive to build, the most profitable units to build will oftentimes be smaller units. They will be studios and one bedroom apartments. Mm -hmm. Whereas building family sized apartments, uh, that will oftentimes be prohibitively expensive. I wonder how you think about that, the, the regulatory piece of things. Are there different strategies we could pursue that would make these desirable high amenity, high productivity cities uh, more tractable for families? It's, it's incredibly hard to separate this conversation from a discussion of land use. Of course. And I know nobody gets excited about talking about land use. I mean, some, some of you get excited about What's talking about land here? use. But for a, maybe for a moment, let's talk about land use. So the city of Vancouver, and I know, you know, you know Derek, you're, you're, you're familiar with its work as well, uh, published a set of regulations uh, about, what was it, you know, eight, nine years ago, mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. where they mandated that a certain percentage of units be two and three bedroom apartments, family sized units designed for families. They programmed public spaces, not just for children, young children, but for teenagers. They built skate parks. They invested in transit. Uh, they basically designed a city for children. And can you believe it? Like, families showed up. And Vancouver has been the one North American mm -hmm. city that has seen a larger and larger and larger, despite being like ridiculously expensive, like one of the most expensive uh, cities in North America, they've seen continued secular growth of the population of families and of children, not just pre-K kids, but you know anyone under the age of 18 in their urban core. And you know, Someone may look at that and say, like, that's the heavy hand of regulation telling a developer they have to build two and three bedroom apartments. But I would argue that the ship there has already sailed. In 1961, New York City passed its first zoning code that introduced the concept of FAR and effectively capped what you can build in any piece of dirt in this city. That was when the heavy hand of regulation happened. The land use market is already effectively socialistic. And now it's just about what incentives is the government putting forth uh, to get the outcome we want, to get so an equitable outcome. So this regulation could be understood as correcting a, a, an earlier wave of regulation. Absolutely. And, any, and you, you could look at it either way. You could either say, hey, we're going to take, uh, we're going to continue down the regulatory path and say, we are going to try to tweak the regulations to get the outcome we want. Obviously, if you cap floor area and buildable square footage, people are going to build the highest, most profitable units in the limited square footage they have. Within the incredible constraints that have been Within created the by the regulations. Within the constraints that have been created. Uh, or you can take a deregulatory approach and say, let's abolish the concept of FAR. Uh, let's let people build. Um, either, in my view, would get to a environment in a city that is more hospitable to families. Can I just jump on um, to talk a little bit more about Vancouver? Uh, I think you know more about the details, so I just want to give some of the, the broad picture Please. color. I think it's what's really cool about the Vancouver plan, and you should know, like among urbanist nerds, like Vancouver really is the darling of urban family policy. Um, so if you're interested <laughs> in where the U.S. could go, like you know, uh, look west, young and or old man or woman. Um, the, what, what Vancouver did that I think is really interesting is two things. First, they asked, they surveyed a thousand of their own residents and they were like, what's missing? Why are families leaving? What do you as experts in families want from this city? So first they asked and then when they answered the question, 
they didn't think of it as, oh, families are 32 and 35 year olds who have four year old kids, so let's make sure that that family has a affordable and happy time in Vancouver. They were like, no, we're defining child as ages zero through 18. Mm -hmm. And we're going to divide our approach to making Vancouver family friendly by having a zero to six month plan, a one to five year plan, a young child plan, a teenager plan. Like the roller skating rinks were not from interviewing families that had six month olds. It was okay. interviewing families with kids who were however old people are who skateboard. I don't, so I have no idea. <laughs> I need to do a survey. Um, and, so, so I, and so I think it's really cool how they thought about this as a life cycle problem and not just a, oh, like kids need parks and families need space. So we're just gonna build a park here and have some affordable housing development over here and bing, bam, boop, we're done. Um, it was really interesting how they considered the, the changes in child needs across the lifespan. Was the, so this survey was specifically geared towards families? I believe it was, yes. yeah. Kay, you uh, are in the heart of Brownstone, Brooklyn, uh, a place that's home to many aspirational families, families who are deeply invested in, in their kids and, and their kids' future well-being, which you discussed earlier on. So public education is another service that is very much on the minds of families. Uh, you know, Derek had mentioned that you do have babies who were born in Brooklyn, and yet for whatever reason, as those babies approach school age, that's when a lot of folks wind up decamping. So can you talk to us a little bit about the climate around those issues? <laughs> hmm. um, it's changing, I think. Uh, so when I moved here in the 80s, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to live in Park Slope is because it was zoned, in my area was zoned for a school that had a great reputation, public school, that had an elementary school, had a great reputation. And we thought, well, we'll deal with middle school and high school later. So uh, it was not all it was cracked up to be, but it was okay. Um, the school still has a great reputation. Over time, as the uh, number of educated families, uh, middle class families who moved in to our area spread out into other brownstone areas and then gradually into uh, uh, Williamsburg, even Bushwick. Bushwick is mostly singles, I think, uh, but, but into Williamsburg. Uh, the, some of the schools started to improve. I think there was a lot of demand from middle class parents um, to address their needs. And also, um, quite frankly, a, a certain um, number of middle class kids who are coming from the kinds of homes that I'm describing where there's so much emphasis on child development change the dynamics of the classroom in many cases. So things were getting a little better. Something is happening now that I, I think is very alarming and may well drive a lot of middle class families out. Uh, and that is the um, emergence of the, uh, this new uh, regime under, under our current chancellor. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of you got a chance to read the article in The Atlantic by George Packer that's making a big uh, uh, fuss in, the, in the social media. There's another article by another District 15, that's my district, uh, parent Matt Welch who writes for Reason. They're what they're describing is, and I, I don't wanna be too hysterical about this, but they're describing a real undermining of sort of basic educational principles um, in favor of a fairly extreme view of political, of uh, uh, diversity and the needs of diversity. So uh, the, some, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this because it'll take us too far afield, but I think what's happening is if you look at articles like Packer's and Matt Welch's, uh, you will see that there are a lot of uh, middle class parents who are going, wait a minute, this is not working out for our families. Now, 
These are devoted urbanites, so it's hard to know exactly what they'll do. Will they bring pressure on the schools to do what they need them to do or want them to do? I don't know. Uh, it's hard to imagine them moving to the suburbs. Um, well, that, that's one dimension of it, and also you've written um, brilliantly on uh, the Fujianese population, yes. the working class immigrant populations yes. that have dealt with their own struggles with um, the shifting political winds around public That's education right. in the city. That's so, right. So I, I do want to be sure we get to Q&A. So, oh, okay. so I just before we do, uh, I just one quick question for you, Brad. So you mentioned in passing just the way that some of these new housing units, uh, you're embedding uh, childcare into them. And I'm mm -hmm. curious to hear just a tiny bit about the economics of this, because that sounds just like a really innovative idea. And I just kind of wonder about, you know, kind of how how that works in practice. Well, the, the most interesting stat that we really base this on is that if you look at top 25 metros, families that have at least one child, on average, spend more on childcare than they do on rent. Hmm. So you're actually talking about a larger uh, chunk of spend where relatively small optimizations are able to get a huge savings. So there's two layers by which we're building childcare in. One is daycare in the building uh, that is staffed for relatively long hours. So dealing with the friction of commuting and coordinating. Exactly. And so it's, 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 it's a meaningful friction when you have your house over here, you have your daycare over here, you have your work over here, you end up with this jujitsu of who has to be where, when, where is the stroller, where is the car, if you have a car. Uh, and so in-building daycare is a, is, a, is a huge value add. Uh, the other is uh, running a nanny share program. Um, so we're working with a third party for the nanny supply, uh, but actually having a program that matches families based on preference, based on children's age, uh, to share a nanny that was you know incredible for for me and our family uh, to not only you know save money socialize the kid uh, as well as you know kind of share some of the uh, joys and struggles of childcare with uh, you know and, and child rearing with another family I think you know, what, you know sometimes we, we you know it's 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 easy to talk a lot about you know land use and, and policy and economics but sometimes you forget that like when you're the only one of your peers that has a child, or the only person in your building that has a child, how lonely that can be and how weird you feel. And you know, maybe to end on a very, and I, I, I almost consider myself the optimist on this panel, but to end on a pessimistic <laughs> note, oddly, <laughs> uh, I, I, I worry a little bit about a tipping point whereby you have so few kids in cities that the experience of having a kid in a city makes you such an outlier and so alienated from mm. your peers around you that you effectively have to do a resetting of your friend group uh, and almost inevitability, uh, inevitably have to move. And uh, that's, I, I worry a lot about that tipping point um, and how can we prevent that from happening. Questions? Ed Thompson, Ayn Rand Institute. I was going to mention two elements, but uh, you finally brought up the subject of education. And um, as many decades as I can remember, people were moving out of New York City for school districts, what they at least thought were good school districts. And I don't think you've, any of you have addressed that. And I think that that's a prime mover for what you're talking about. And the other subject is you can talk about FARs and land use and so forth, which is fine. I'm well aware of that. But regulation per se, I long for the day when Bloomberg came into office and raised the real estate taxes by 18%. If only I could pay that now. <laughs> so regulation, taxes, education, isn't that what this is about more than anything else? Would anyone like to feel that? Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, 
Well, I, I, I went to a pretty bad public school in Arkansas myself, and I agree with you that, that you know, educational quality does drive a lot of this. It drives a huge amount of this. And it's something we struggle with as a family of like, you know, we're, we're planning to send our kid to PS11. It's a great public school. But, you know, I'm, I read Packer's article and, you know, my wife and I are talking about that. And so you, so you have to think about that. You have to think about how do you create educational options as you, as you build housing for families. It's a debate we have on the kin team of, you know, do we have a opinion around the school districts that, that we're located in? I, I, let's flip a little bit to land use. June and the laws that were passed were disastrous for, you know, many owners and developers uh, in the city. Um, you know, I go back and forth. I actually think it will get a lot worse before it gets better. I think if you look at inner, other international, uh, other global cities that are facing some of the same political pressures, they're not debating, you know, rent control and vacancy decontrol. They're 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 debating expropriation, oh. and this is going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. That is my personal opinion, and as we talk to our real estate partners, we're 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 planning for that. I'm hoping for a question that elicits greater optimism. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? Uh, yes. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not. Much <laughs> I shouldn't have. Done <laughs> no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't have asked me. Um, but I'm. I'm glad education has arisen because that seemed to me the elephant in the room that wasn't really being addressed. Um, and I think we've now discussed, briefly at least, how education plays a role in out-migration. Uh, if you're a young family starting out and you have to make your choices, even before this new woke and diversity ethos took hold, there was a good reason to move out of the city. But leaving that aside, I want to pick up on Kay's point about the knowledge economy. And it just seems to me that there's a tie-in between the uh, decrease in fertility and family size and the rise of the knowledge economy. It costs an awful lot, and it, not only in money, to raise a child and to raise a child successfully so that they have the right preschool and the right school and the right advantages to get into the right college. And how many people can afford that? How, I, I was watching the Ken Burns country music documentary, and uh, Hank Williams and Ernest Tubb and all those people came from families with 10 and 12 children. How many families do we know with 10 and 12 <laughs> children? Who could afford 10 and 12 children? Well, there are still people who have 10 and 12 children, but they are people who are not linked into the knowledge economy. And if you're linked into the knowledge economy, the most kids you're probably going to have are one, two, or maybe at most three. And I'll just close with an anecdote from a friend who was sending, looking around and finally found a preschool for his uh, young daughter. And I asked him what it was costing him for preschool. And he said, $20,000 a year. And I said, what? And he said, but they have really good crayons. <laughs> <laughs> Kay, is the world being denied many great country musicians? Because people are having <laughs> no, doubt. no doubt. Um, you know, the knowledge, I, it, it, there's all kinds of reasons to be very worried about the economy and how it's filtering out all kinds of people um, and how it's affecting our politics. Uh, that's, I think, become pretty clear to a lot of people. Um, but I, I want to just give one, uh, two cheers, or one cheer for <laughs> the knowledge economy that brings up, thing, comes back to the uh, question of the country singers. Um, the knowledge economy has also opened up, you know, it, 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 it not only is, is uh, creating more lawyers and doctors and, and uh, people in communications and all of that stuff, 
But it's also opened a whole uh, field in design and the arts, and mm -hmm. there are possibilities now for people that didn't exist when I was growing up to make a decent living. Now, not necessarily in New York City. That's a, that's a separate question. Um, but I, you know, it is a varied economy, and I think that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. But there's no question that um, what you say is true, that the, the kind of intensive, intensive parenting that goes, it's sometimes called concerted cultivation, that's required of aspirational parents now is, is quite, uh, quite remarkable. Not always good for kids, uh, as <laughs> many of you have probably witnessed, and um, not good for family life often, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, is not being satisfied by urban school system. Hi. Um, so much of this has been talking about a traditional nuclear family. How does this exodus impact the non-traditional nuclear families that are left behind who, if there aren't people demanding the good schools and all of that, how, how is this in the housing if they are n not going to be able to afford that nanny care and all that, how, how does that impact the rest of mm -hmm. the folks left behind? But Derek, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean. I'll answer that a bit, and then I'll also uh, talk, I just wanted to say something about childcare costs as well, because I think this is a really important issue, even outside the context of this conversation. Um, I am concerned about Brad's point, that um, cultures have tipping points, and cultures also have socialization, and that if you have a city that has, or a suburb, that has a lot of families, and the families are supportive of each other, and they talk a lot about you know, the, the parenting strategies, and they say, you know, here's how I got my baby to sleep, here's how I got my baby to sleep. That's a wonderful, nurturing environment to raise children in. It becomes less wonderful and nurturing when you feel like you're an alien in your own city. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there is, it's, it is worth worrying about the fact that only 18% of housing units in Manhattan, uh, five boroughs, are uh, traditional nuclear families, because it, it does suggest to me that if right now it's you know trending toward a sixth, um, you could easily have more people say, "I'm going to leave," and a sixth becomes you know a seventh, an eighth, and it, and you you get a lower and lower share of traditional families in New York, and you, you enter a kind of you know this is very dramatic, uh, uh, but a, a, a sort of a traditional family death spiral in certain areas where it just becomes so uncomfortable to be a family there. Um, I, that mm -hmm. that is something to worry about. Um, I think that the issue of childcare costs is just a, a, a national crisis that needs to be dealt with. And I wish I had a really good answer right now. Like, this is how we deal with it. Um, you, there's, you could have deregulation, an answer that I just heard from the front row, which is, um, I think, not a bad answer. I do think that an element um, of, rising issue, of rising costs in childcare is just, um, you know, you sort of have just, this is a classic example, it's just sort of almost cost disease. You just want, like, you're not going to have these kids being raised by robots. It's hard to make it more efficient on a labor um, basis, and as a result, the prices for the labor just tend to increase with productivity advances. Um, uh, there are sort of, you know, uh, answers on sort of the federal policy side, you know, both not only Democrats, but also Rubio are thinking that all, not of you know, cradle to grave socialism, but cradle and grave socialism. You, know, take, you have Medicare, you have Social Security for old people. Um, should we have universal health care for kids and a, an expanded child care benefit? That is becoming, I, I see, a, a relatively bipartisan idea. Um, so that wouldn't necessarily fix the problem. It might just mean that parents have more money that they're spending on child care and the child care costs mm -hmm. just balloon. Um, it's a tough problem to fix in part because people love their children so much and are, are not going to want to necessarily pay for you know, a, 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 what seems to them to be cheapskate uh, childcare policy or cheapskate um, a school or, or, or pre-K system. Um, but I, I, I think it's a, it's a really important issue that, that goes to this issue, not only in cities but in suburbs. Just to tease out another 
part of the question. Um, it's interesting to think about nuclear families versus multi-generational families. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when you're looking at all sorts of families, uh, including working class immigrant families, just relying on grandparents and what have you, it almost seems as though, Brad, some of what you're doing with kin, some of what you're doing with these facilities, is trying to recreate what family networks used to provide people. You'd have an aunt or yep. an uncle or you'd have a grandparent. Kay, you have a little bit of experience with this. Do you mm -hmm. see the multi-generational family making a comeback in some of these expensive cities? Um, well, I, I that's not what I see statistically, but I mean, I'm certainly seeing examples, anecdotal examples of that uh, among my own friends uh, who want to be close to their kids and are finding ways to bring the kids and their children closer to them. So that is, uh, I w but I think that most, I think most people who are living in cities, young people, young families are uh, far away from from their families. Now you I, you still hear about people moving to be near their families. I think there's a real longing for that. And it's also a reason why some people don't move to cities of opportunity because yes, of the need for that multi-generational family. Yeah. I w can I just um, answer or or bring up the point that Sarah raised about non you know the non middle class families? Um, remember that in New York City. 37% of our population is foreign born, and many, many of those people are poor. And it's always been a mystery to me how we could have such high housing costs mm -hmm. and such poor people. Um, a lot of it, you know, we do have in New York, I've forgotten the uh, data, but is it something like a million um, uh, regulated uh, uh, apartments or homes? Um, but I think there's probably a lot of uh, black market stuff going yeah. on. Yeah, sure. You know? A lot of basement. Probably a lot of the, right. there's right. Basement. an immense right. amount of basement right. apartments, yeah. uh, yeah. illegally subdivided single-family right. homes, Dorm, things like that. There's right. there's yeah. an immense amount of that, and ultimately, you know, it's a it's a response to regulation of you have many neighborhoods that are still you know, R1, R2 zones for single family homes and most of the single family homes have been chopped up into SRO units. Right. And there are many cases those SRO units are rented to families illegally, yeah. all illegally. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just funny, you know, unfortunately it's ex incredibly unsafe yeah. and you often have real, real disasters there and you wonder what would happen if you were to change the zoning? And that's why I, I look at zoning as not a, a, an ancillary issue to rent regulations, but actually the primary issue in rent regulations being kind of a, 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 an awkward uh, you know, follow-on mm -hmm. to the primary problem, wow. which is a fundamental restriction on supply. So we don't have much time left. I propose um, getting two questions in a row and then allowing the panel to answer them together. Uh, so there's a gentleman back there. Thank you. Uh, the first thing I'd point out is that the other trend taking place is virtually every nation around the world is the increased ownership of pets. And I think mm. it is related yeah. to decreased fertility. Um, my question is, um, the, uh, what is the incentive for elected officials and policymakers on the local level uh, to do the difficult things to accommodate this shrinking part of their constituency? It's very difficult to have a high-performing uh, urban school system. It's very difficult to shift land use regulations. Um, mayors and county officials, maybe they're just happy to have grown-up amusement parks. Well, partly because you know children are consumers of services in many cases, mm -hmm. whereas affluent childless singles don't necessarily consume mm -hmm. as much. So from a fiscal perspective, one can see why that would be attractive. Just let's get in one other question. Um, there's, uh, and before we allow uh, you to answer the two of them in tandem, so there's someone here, yeah, I believe, yeah. I see a hand up. The young lady there. Hey, just to, uh, my name's Emily Bells, I'm with World Magazine. Um, 
to launch off your point about multi-generational families, um, what do you think about the role of um, outside civic institutions like synagogues or churches that can be the family for families and make living in the city more doable? Okay, so uh, the role of civic organizations and also just the politics of, of taking on some of these challenges. Yeah. Sure, I, I, can, I, I want to I respond to your comment. Um, uh, the gentleman's comment. It's interesting because you know I was talking about in hyperbolic terms, sort of the the, the potential death spiral that can happen when you have you know a smaller a, a smaller and smaller share of the of the city being families, which means that those individual families make a decision to move somewhere where there are more families, they can feel more nurtured. An interesting implication of that idea and the idea of the city as an entertainment machine for the young and affluent is that the young and affluent don't tend to have much geographical allegiance. The whole right. thing about Washington, D.C. is that it's a trampoline. Like, you, mm -hmm. you're 22, you go for four years, you go somewhere else. That's what everyone does. And on the one hand, you could say, well, that's fine, because cities specialize. They agglomerate. And maybe Washington, D.C. and New York are just going to specialize in being the greenhouse of the young urban affluent, and then they will sprout families somewhere else. I think, though, a danger is that if you have a large share of cities where the individuals don't feel like they belong there or owe much to the city because they have no expectation of being there in 10 years, that that creates or feeds into a lot of the political problems that you address. So one thing that I guess a lot of these, a politician that would have to employ the Vancouver model, one thing that he would have to do is either identify in that transient young affluent group a value or culture that says, I want this city to be a city of families, even if I'm not particularly thinking about one at the moment and I'm just on Tinder, but also <laughs> to, like, to be really clear about targeting and marketing to say, if I'm going to be the Vancouver candidate, the, the urban family candidate, I'm going to have to be very, very clever about who I market to, because this is not the kind of city with 90% of housing units being traditional families. It's 18. Uh, it, I think that transience actually speaks to your question, which is that a lot of these religious institutes, civic institutions, are in trouble because there is such a large population of single and transient people uh, they don't tend to be that as engaged uh, in in religious institutions and other civic civic groups. So it's interesting. So I I, I I spend a lot of time meeting with cities and with 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 electeds in cities. And interestingly, like the thing they in many ways care the most about are families. Mm -hmm. Like they really care about families almost across the board. And. The, the inverse of that is they almost exclusively do not care about young single people. And you would say, like, well, why is that? That's kind of a strange thing. Mm. The reason that family is that families vote. Yeah. Families <laughs> vote. Right. They're really invested in their community. These local right. elections right. are decided by such small numbers of the constituency that Families that are invested in their community actually decide who gets elected. So you may ask, well, then why are families having such a rough time in these cities? And I would argue the reason is that they vote against their own interests, which is, is yeah. sound right. So, so, so hear me <laughs> out. So families, when they actually go to the ballot box, tend to vote for exclusionary zoning. They tend to support the candidates that will preserve on-street parking, despite <laughs> the fact that there's a lot of research out there that shows that the car centricity of cities make it harder and harder and harder to raise families. Uh, they tend to vote uh, you know, down ballot certain parties uh, that tend to roll out more regulatory pressure. Uh, they tend to vote against their own interests, and I don't well, know how to solve that their interests as a unit. They don't vote for their interests as a class. Right, like they vote for their interests family. as an individual. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't and vote for the key. interests the of families. Families don't yes. see themselves necessarily as a class. As a class. Like yeah. white evangelicals are a class. 
families are a unit. And so when you're a yeah. family and you're like, what is best for me? You're thinking, what might be best for me and my house, my apartments or condos, you my know, parking future spot. house, <laughs> future value, yeah. that's not what's best for families as a class. Yeah, that's a good Great. point. Please join me in thanking Derek, Kay, and Brad.